I was absolutely delighted um, when uh, my friends here asked me to come and speak to you about spiritual memoir. Um, I don't know that I entirely anticipated that this would become something that I would be known for um, and that people would look to me um, as a teacher and a guide um, in this particular area. I trained as a historian and the last thing <laughs> that historians usually do um, or write spiritual memoirs. Um, as a matter of fact, the sort of academic writing I was trained in was always a sort of distanced, you're telling a story about someone else's life. Um, you're not telling a story about your own life. But after writing my own dissertation, the very first ever trade book I wrote was a book called Strength for the Journey. And it was a spiritual memoir. Um, I wrote it when I was around 40. I don't necessarily suggest writing spiritual memoir when you're only 30 or 40, because one of the things that happens is like, well, what happens next? You know, <laughs> it's like, it might've been a little bit too early, but I will be talking about that book along, along the way, because that was my first trade book, Strength for the Journey. And then uh, 20 years later, when I turned 60, I returned to writing an outright uh, spiritual memoir in a book called Freeing Jesus. So I have these interesting bookends um, in my career, 40 and 60, um, where I was working very overtly in this form. But in between those two books, all of my work deals with some level of memoir. Um, depends on the project that there will be a little bit of memoir uh, sort of sprinkled in to make particular points. There'll be a bigger amount of memoir if I want to frame up an entire theme through the personal story. Um, and it's sort of the, the different kinds of levels of how much memoir I use depends on the project I'm working on. So two memoirs, 20 years apart, and in between the use of memoir as part of narrating uh, spirituality and faith um, in America, the different things that I've written about through the years. So spiritual memoir. One of the things that I was told in advance is that you've already had a un unit on memoir, what it means to write a memoir. Spiritual memoir is is different. Um, it is not just writing your story. Uh, spiritual memoir is a very specific form of memoir. It's a, it is your story, but it's your story woven together with the story of God. And so you're bringing in two pieces um, as you're telling your story how your own life is unfolded, but how your life is unfolded in conversation with. And if, if you're uncomfortable with the word God, it doesn't, doesn't have to be about God per se, but about a tradition, about a church, about uh, a set of spiritual practices that you may have inherited from your family. It could be about a philosophy that you have embraced yourself. Uh, spiritual memoir is as varied as the kinds of people who write about it. So you can have Buddhist spiritual memoir or Jewish spiritual memoir. You can have, uh, I've, I've seen people who write sort of what I would call secular spiritual memoirs, where they literally talk about their journey away from any kind of idea of a transcendent or divine character that you could call God, but that they still have an awareness of awe and wonder, and um, they write about that. So spiritual and memoir have to combine, though, and it's about weaving together those kinds of threads between the life of, of some sort of tradition that brings you more deeply into awareness of wonder, love, and compassion, and then your own life. So that's the what I think of just sort of a, as a first outing as to what is a spiritual memoir. It's that weaving of two things, our lives 
and the life of spirit. Um, I, it, in freeing Jesus at the end of that book, I told a story on myself and that is freeing Jesus was not strictly, um, a spiritual memoir, because if you think about that term, spiritual memoir, the word spiritual comes first and memoir comes second. And that means the, the, the sort of the accent of the whole genre falls on the person who is writing it. Um, so it's spiritual memoir. I kind of flipped the script in uh, Freeing Jesus. And what I called that book at the in the last uh, couple pages of it, I called it a uh, memoir theology. And I did that because I wanted the reader to be left at the end with a theology of Jesus that arose out of my experience, not how Jesus changed me. And so I think that you can do that too. And that is, you might not necessarily be writing a spiritual memoir where the reader is left um, thinking about your life, but you could write it as memoir, your, your experience through the, the, the world. And then you can write it about memoir spirituality or memoir faith or memoir theology. And so you can change the emphasis up by wanting to leave your reader with some spiritual practice or some set of ideas or passions you have um, about God or something that shapes you in your life of faith. So spiritual memoir is that weaving, and then it involves those two words in some order, spiritual and memoir. Now, I'm following some questions that LaVon and uh, Bruce gave me, and I love these questions because they give me a chance to just serve speak out of my passion for what I do um, and also to be very spontaneous with this. And I often find that that's one of the joys of like um, bookstore events uh, when you just release a book is you get up with a group of people you've never met before, you read a paragraph or two or a couple pages out of your book, and then they start asking you questions and you never know what's going to happen. And in effect, um, Bruce and Levon asked me a bunch of questions about what I do as a writer. And so I thought I would just follow these. Uh, the second question that's on their list, we went from what is spiritual memoir? And, and because I'm a writer, I pay a lot of attention to the words at the beginning of a sentence. And so the second question is, how uh, do we write spiritual memoir and then add this piece onto it, justice? And that question actually blows my mind. You think that that's a question that is kind of a throwaway or, you know, why would that be a big deal question? Spiritual memoir through history has usually been about our internal spiritual lives. Um, if you look at the, uh, if you look at, take, take say 25 memoirs that were written before 1950, throughout the whole history of the church, the emphasis of spiritual memoir was usually the interrogation of the inner life and to try to figure out where and how God was operative within one's own soul. And then you share that with the world as a a, a pattern of life that other people might be interested in as a potential suggestion of where and how to find God as a narrative about your own life struggles to encourage other people. But spiritual memoir historically has been about internal reflection. And so as soon as I saw this question, spiritual memoir and justice, how do we write it? Well, we don't really know. Because people haven't been doing this kind of writing for much more than I'd say 50 years, 60 years, sort of at the max, 70, if you really push it to the outside, because the question has switched up, not just from that internal question, so what is the work of God in my soul, 
But the second question, when you add justice in, is thinking about spiritual memoir and its external effects. So what difference does my spiritual life make? Whatever the struggle is that I've had with God, whatever these internal realizations are that have come to me through uh, this, this story of weaving together my life and the life of God, what external effect is that going to have? And so this is actually a really creative and interesting and even, I think, edge cutting kind of question in the way that we think about spirituality, that it's about more than our own personal struggles. This It's not just a, a sort of a navel gazing exercise, even though a lot of spiritual memoir in the history of Christianity has been internal we're asking this question of how does it move out well that gave me pause and there's a second how question on this list that is next to me um, and it's further down on the list but i moved it up because i wanted the two how questions together and the second how question is um well how do you write in this particular genre so if you think about the first question, how do we write spirituality, spiritual memoir and justice? The question is we're inventing it, as, or the answer is we're inventing it as we go along. And we're participating in a very new form of writing. So then the second how is, well, then how do we write in this particular genre that we're basically creating um, in these generations? Well, the way that interestingly enough, um, I've done it. And that's, I really had to stop. Like I said, it gave me pause. I had to stop and really think about this. That first book that I wrote when I was 40 uh, was called Standing Against the Whirlwind. And the way that I wrote it was I was trying to speak against an idea that was prevalent in American culture. And that idea was that only evangelical, very conservative theological churches could grow. And it just so happened in the 1990s that I was participating in an incredibly progressive Episcopal church in Santa Barbara, California, where the church was so sort of willing to try anything, uh, that we hired the very first ever out gay uh, priest in the Diocese of Los Angeles to be our pastor. And this being part of this church was eye-opening for me, that here I was in this very, very liberal, very progressive, very social justice um, congregation, and it was the fastest growing church I'd ever been part of. And as a matter of fact, all of the churches that were theologically very conservative in Santa Barbara were churches that were declining. And this church, along with a Unitarian church and a UCC church in Santa Barbara, they were growing. And so what I just, what I saw was I was living a story that flew in the face of the conventional wisdom of how people talked about American religion. Oh, look at evangelicals or evangelicals everywhere. Evangelicals are where it's at. You know, they're the ones with all the power and they make all the noise. And yet here I was experiencing this entirely different reality. And so I thought, I want to talk about this. And the way that I chose to talk about it was through my own life, growing up, th going through evangelicalism and changing my mind about evangelicalism through my own experience in six different Episcopal churches over a 20 year period, early adulthood from the time I was 20 to the time I was 40. And so how do, how did I put that book together? You'll notice that what happened with that book is there was, there was a disjunction between my experience, my lived experience of something that I was passionate about, something that was in my frame of view this very cool church with this very liberal minister and this amazing congregation. And every week we'd come to church and there were more and more people in the pews. 
And there was no way to explain that. So that was a disjunction between the the public narrative of Christianity and what was happening on the ground where I was. So there's the question. Now, how do I engage it? I created a map and what I did, and this is how I write almost everything I write. So here I'm giving you a very practical piece of writer insight is I, I had one line was my life. The second line was the six different churches that I had been part of. And the third line was the major point of theology that I had to deal with in each one of those churches. And so I constructed the, this particular book in chronological order with these three lines, me, the churches, and then theological questions and what i did then was i stitched like this between the three lines to create in this case these six vignettes these six chapters about these six different churches and each one of them came out differently you know one was about hospitality and the practice of hospitality one was about the struggle for women's ordination one was about um my re my really deep struggle with um lgbtq rights and how i became an activist actually in the, in that field in the 90s and so you can see what's happening there it's like a story of me a story of of community the churches and then it's also a story of god these theological questions all that emerge from scripture and so i wasn't really thinking to myself how can i write a book about justice but the question that fueled this whole project was a justice question and that was who counted whose story was being told in public whose voices were not being heard and um i i was angry uh because i felt that the stories of the good people that i knew were missing from the public narrative and that they had something to say about what the shape of christianity should be for the future uh in a, for its future in america um if you read freeing jesus i know some of you have uh you'll notice that i employed very much the same kind of method uh I, instead of uh, looking at church, there's a story of me, uh, and it's mostly, I cover not 20 years there, I cover 40 years, or maybe even 60 years, my whole life. The earliest memory in freeing Jesus is from when I was two and a half years old. So I'm, I'm looking at a much wider spread. So, so there's a story of me, so it's about memoir. But then there's a story about jesus so there's a story of, of something having to do with spirituality in this fact that this time i'm looking very much at the person of jesus second person of the trinity i'm looking at a story of god um and then the third story is how my mind has changed and the there's a framing that is I think kind of subtle in freeing Jesus, but it's very important. And that is the one of the earliest stories I tell in the book is me as a teeny tiny little girl uh, sitting in a circle in a Methodist Sunday school classroom, probably 1963, uh, maybe as late as 1964, but I really think it was before then. And the teacher was giving us the story of how Jesus loves the little children. And um, as we're sitting there and she's telling us this story about how Jesus welcomed all the little children to her, uh, to himself, she holds up a picture of Jesus. And um, I did not grow up in a white church with that picture of white Jesus. Instead, I grew up in a, pic in a Methodist church where the primary picture of Jesus that was introduced to us as children was a, a vaguely Semitic looking Jesus <laughs> in, in, that was in this, this picture. And that Jesus was surrounded by little children from every racial and ethnic group you can imagine. And 
I can remember being, like I said, two and a half, three years old, staring at this picture, sort of searching the picture for me. Where am I in that picture? There was a little black girl. There was a little native indigenous girl. There were clearly Asian children in the picture. And finally, my eyes landed. There was one little girl who looked Caucasian, who was standing right next to Jesus. And she was laying her head on Jesus' shoulder. And I found her and I looked at her and I went, oh, I'm in the picture. And that circle from feeling like I was in the picture and that Jesus loved me and loved all of us, everybody in that picture, everybody in that circle. That's the first memory of the book. The book arcs out to its final circle, which happens in 2015, where I'm sitting on in a circle on a stage in Salt Lake City, Utah at the World Parliament of Religions. And I'm sitting in a circle with 20 other women. And at that point, I am the only one of two women in that whole circle who are Christian women. And I was sitting between uh, Deepak Chopra's daughter and Malcolm X's granddaughter. And my mind flew back to the Methodist childhood Sunday school circle. And I realized that my whole life had played out in circles of inclusion. And so that was the third layer of this book to show how Christianity was not a religion that excluded and that Jesus is not in the embodiment of God who it says, I am the only way and everybody else is going to go to hell. But instead, Jesus is the one who calls us into endless circles of love that widen over time. And so the book becomes very much a book about justice. And it's very shaped, I think, by the narratives, particularly that um, were unfolding during the, the Trump presidency, the Me Too movement, uh, the, the compl complicity of white evangelicalism um, with uh, this kind of neo-authoritarian uh, Christian nationalist fascism that's developing. I don't really like using that word very much, but there it is. Um, and so three levels again, uh, me, Jesus, and not a specific theology, but this idea that justice is shaped like a circle and showing how that plays out over six decades of my own life. Um, that's the, those are ways that you actually approach, I think, writing is that there's a question that starts burning in your soul. And then the, I have always been the kind of writer who thinks of layers. Maybe that's because I'm a historian. Um, historians naturally think in things like archeological layers and layers of text and all that kind of stuff. So I think very naturally in layers. And so I'm always excavating my own life and the world around me to try to see what are the layers that I want to, in effect, um, quilt or knit together in this particular piece that I'm writing. Um, I had a, my friends here send out a piece that I recently wrote. It's, it's a pretty short piece. It, it would take about six minutes, maybe five or six minutes to read. It's called The Saints We Don't Need. And um, I sent it to you, uh, not, I, not because I'm going to sit here and read it, the whole thing to you, but it shows how you can use memoir in a very short piece. So it, I just used the example of two books, uh, Strength, for the, uh, Strength for the Journey. Did I say Stay Against Whirlwind? That was my dissertation title. Strength for the Journey was my first uh, trade book. It was my first um, um, autobiographical spiritual memoir piece. Um, and then uh, Freeing Jesus is the one that I wrote when I was uh, was 60. But you don't have to do a whole book. And, and so to be able to do something that you send out, 
that's only two pages long, um, I thought would be a useful exercise uh, for you. And you can see, and the only pieces I'll point out to you while we're here is it starts out and you get where I'm going. I'm starting with a piece of spiritual memoir. I stood on the hill and looked out over the wide river. A stronger than expected breeze blew the brown beanie from my head. Uh oh, what is she doing wearing a brown beanie? Uh -huh. As I chased it across the lawn, the old plantation house rose behind me and my Girl Scout troop leader. Bing, bing, bing. Okay, now you got it. She's writing not only memoir, but she's actually giving us a memory. She's recreating a scene from her own childhood. Uh, my Girl Scout troop leader called me back to the group. That's the Potomac River girls, our guide said. Perhaps this is exactly where George Washington was when he tossed a silver dollar over to the other side. The water sparkled in the spring sunshine. What a big river. How could anyone throw a coin to the opposite shore? George Washington, the father of our country and first president, must have possessed supernatural strength. Like Superman? Of course, those are all the memories of a little girl. And then what I do in this piece, because it's called The Saints We Don't Need, is I turn, turn the picture. And as it happens, um, as an adult, I wind up living right up the street from Mount Vernon, this place that I visited when I was a little girl um, in Girl Scout Troop. And then I start reflecting on it from the perspective of now. And uh, let me see if I can find uh, where you start seeing the turn. Through some twists of fate, I wound up living in Mount Vernon. The house we bought more than 20 years ago sits on a piece of property once owned by George Washington on the far edges of the Mount Vernon estate. The houses in the neighborhoods around us, mostly built from 1950 to 1980, are similar in size and style. We're the post-war suburban sprawl of Northern Virginia, and here's the twist, built on hunting lands where Pocahontas's tribe once roamed and where English squires built massive estates. Well, they didn't build them. They had the people they held in slavery do the actual building. And now you see how I'm taking this warm memory shared by so many uh, white women of mid-century America of the Brownie Troop visit to Mount Vernon. And I'm beginning to point toward how that memory is both something I cherish, but is calling me in a different way. And uh, that's what I mean by excavating, you know, our, our memory is that you have the memory, but then sometimes you need to sort of peel back the layers of it and start asking different questions um, of it. And so, so this was a, a really fun little piece to write. Um, I wrote it in context with a class that I'm doing online with some other people. And we're talking about saints and what constitutes a saint. And so this was a piece that was critical of one of our American saints, um, George Washington. And I tried to not just say let's take George Washington off its pedestal because the piece itself mm. actually doesn't say that it just says how can we be more honest about these kinds of histories and so I I did it through memoir and um, when I stand on the hill now I remember the world of that eight-year-old girl and I think of how I understand George now he doesn't inspire all but he does remind me of how awful we human beings can be, even as we do some truly great things with our wounded lives. We should try to avoid that. We can do better. And I think of those who also stood here, those once held in bondage, looking out over the water, believing as the enslaved did, that they were born on the water as they longed to cross that very water to freedom. And so then you can hear me as an adult white woman, you think, well, wait a second, how does she know that? Is she paying attention to what black history teaches us? You damn right I am. I learned a lot. And so I can, I'm not appropriating it, 
but I'm nodding to the fact that I have learned and I have heard, and this is something that other white people can do as well. And that will create greater justice and greater possibility for a real conversation and a genuine appreciation of the multiplicity of stories that we bear about. In this case, the story is mostly about American sainthood, as it were, um, who are our American heroes. And so, so, so you don't have to write a whole book. You can do it that way. Um, those are probably my longest parts uh, are the what and the how questions. Um, I think that those two questions right there are just so stunning. Um, the, it, much more quickly, I'd like to point out a couple of things in these other questions that caught my attention. There was also a why question. Uh, what led the presenter, I guess that's me, to focus on spiritual memoir and justice as key uh, to career and or life purpose? Uh, the answer is following the Holy Spirit. That's it. <laughs> my life took me here. And um, as a Christian person, I believe that our lives speak powerfully to us. And that's part of the reason I love spiritual memoir. It's a way to listen to how God is prompting us uh, from those deepest places within. And so um, to me, in effect, my life's work is also a work of discernment that presses me ever more deeply into understanding who I am, who God is, and then pushes me out into the world following the Holy Spirit. Hope that doesn't sound too, uh, uh, too uh, hyper pious, but that's the actual real answer. Um, I never really thought of it as a career. Um, I know how hard it is to make money being a writer. Um, I am one of the few very lucky people who makes a decent middle-class salary um, a as a writer. There are some writers, you live in New York City, you probably know a couple of them, who actually get very rich um, as writers. I'm not one of those. I am what's called a working writer, and I have managed to have a decent, good life as a writer. And that is a gift, and I never knew it could actually be done. So I'm very grateful. Um, where is writing spiritual memoir and justice particularly prevalent in the world? Not many places. So if you're going to do it, I can't wait to see what you write. And then who are some other recognized writers in this genre? Um, there are three books that I want to mention to you as ones that I think that this group will really like. There are three books that I have really uh, liked in the last couple of years. I don't know if you've ever have had this guy on, but you really should. Dante Stewart, Shouting in the Fire, an American epistle. Uh, Dante uh, grew up in a conservative Black Pentecostal church. And uh, this little book is his struggle to figure out sort of all over again as an adult what it means to be a Christian black and an American. And so what one of the things I, I sort of feel very um, collegial or I feel I feel a lot of affinity for Dante in the way that he works because he's working in that same way that I just described to you. You can see the three lines through this book. The three lines are his struggle with Christianity, um, his his really deep passion about embracing and celebrating his blackness in a in a world of whiteness and in particularly over and against a world where white supremacy is so uh politically pointed right now and then um what does it mean to be an american um that larger question that so many african americans have struggled with that that really is one of the signature questions i think of uh, of black writing in America. Uh, there are a couple of people who have compared this book to a very young version of James Baldwin. And this is a brilliant book. Um, and I really like him quite a bit as a person. And you can just get a sense. I want to read you just the opening paragraph and you'll see what I, why I get so excited about it. Um, there's an old King James version Bible sitting on my bookshelf. 
it is black, rugged. The gold lining on the pages shines as light hits it. The jacket is missing and the threads are un have unloosened from one another over the years. It has been tried. It has traveled across the South, across time, and now it sits on a shelf where it keeps the company of books written by Black folk, Black folk who have read a very similar Bible, who have wrestled with it, been confused by it, Black folk who have held it as tight as I do today. And you just kind of get that. As soon as that first paragraph unfolds, I mean, honest to goodness, he tells the Bible is there and the Bible itself is black. Those two sentences, that, that is brilliant literary strategy in just two sentences. And so, you know, it's going to be about Christianity. You know, it's going to be about the Bible. You know, it's going to be blackness. And by the end of the paragraph, you also know it's going to be about America. It has been tried. It has traveled across the South, across time. Um, and then you find out a couple paragraphs later, it was his grandmother's Bible. And so it, it, that is just a great book. And I recommend it to you as a book that you might want to talk about. Uh, second book, Jackie Lewis, who's right there in, with you all in New York, the pastor of Middle Church uh, across uh, south of you in town. Uh, Fierce Love, and I love, I love her subtitle, A Bold Path to Ferocious Courage and Rule-Breaking Kindness to Heal the World. Um, Jackie's book... Um, is not like Dante's, but it also has three strands. And what she does is she takes, instead of starting out with like this memory of the Bible and just like plunges into these sort of deep questions of uh, that have sort of roiled the soulfulness of black literature over time, uh, Jackie looks at three sort of different dimensions of where we have to love we have to love ourselves we have to love the people who are within our tribe and we have to love the world and so she sort of takes the the biblical injunction love god love your neighbor uh you know love god as you love yourself and love your neighbor so she takes these three biblical injunctions and then she sprinkles memoir through the whole book and so you learn a whole bunch about Jackie, who is an amazing, intelligent, passionate, wonderful person. Um, but you're also hearing the voice of a preacher who is constantly reminding you uh, of this large call to justice. And so it's it's not in that same sense that Dante's is in this sort of uh, I, I think kind of the center of black justice literature. Uh, Jackie's is uh, very much a book of um, a, a, what I'd call activist literature, kind of get yourself out there in the streets. Uh, but I want you to do it with love at the center of everything. And uh, she unpacks that from her own story. And then the third one, um, as I finish up my remarks, um, <laughs> it's just a stunning book. I I don't have it sitting on my desk because I only originally got it in the form of a manuscript because they asked me to write a recommendation for it. And when I read the first page of it, I wound up reading the entire book before I wrote the blurb. The book is by Paula Stone Williams. And the title is As a Woman. And the subtitle is What I Learned About Power, Sex, and Patriarchy After I transitioned. It is the spiritual memoir of a person who was born um, male, who grew up and uh, got married at age 21 to a woman, wound up being the pastor of a conservative evangelical megachurch, and all the while knew that she didn't fit and so went on this incredibly courageous journey of giving up all of that success um to become her true self and so the evangelical megachurch conservative pastor becomes paula stone 
Williams. And that's the story. And the reason why it grabs you from the first page is that the first thing she tells you about is her wedding night when she was 21 years old, marrying Carol, um, who is now her ex-wife. And um, the way she describes it was that they got married on New Year's Eve. I believe it was 19... I can't remember what, what year it was, 1980-something. Uh, Paul is about my age. And um, it, it, it was horrible. It was, it was rainy. It was cold. It was just like the worst possible sort of framing for a wedding ceremony that you can imagine. And that they show up in this kind of really inexpensive motel for their wedding night and what happens at three o'clock in the morning. And I just, you, you get punched in the face from the first word about a person who is living a lie and you desperately want her from that first page to be able to live her fullest truth and so you start rooting for her and the way in which it's it's this is a classic memoir in the sense that and but it's a spiritual memoir because it's the work of a pastor um, and um, she's still preaching, um, but now she's mostly preaching in corporate uh, settings. Uh, and through TED, she's she's given an enormous number of TED talks. They're all very popular. Um, and she gets invited to Apple and Google and the World Bank and all these different places as a trans woman to talk with mostly men who are in the leadership in these huge you know massive corporations about feminism and why feminism is necessary and what her experience was as once sitting on their side of the table as a successful white man and how that changed immediately when she became a trans woman and how she now understands what being female means and that that is a is a necessary part of the work of justice. And so uh, Paul Stone Williams is amazing and that book is amazing. And so I want to give you three very different kinds of uses of m spiritual memoir. Uh, Dante's re sort of conceptualization of what I would call very James Baldwin. And when you look at somebody who's writing like spiritual memoir towards justice, I think James Baldwin is one of the first people who kind of invents this as a genre. I think a lot of it comes out of black America. And I think a lot of it also comes out of the feminist movements of the seventies and eighties in particular, uh, cause as people from the underside start sort of making their point in public, they often pull on memoir to make their points about justice and so that in these movements of civil rights of of human rights of genuine inclusion um, this is where this genre has emerged and that's why it's still pretty young and that's why it's still remarkably important because we are just beginning to hear these voices and there is so much space for so many more voices and the more of us who use our voices the harder it is to get our voices to be silenced you can't burn everybody's book sorry ron DeSantis. you can't get us all you're going to wind up getting rid of the whole library. And that is just not going to hold water over time. And so um, that's really um, why would I invite people to do this work? That's exactly it right there is that you get to stand on the ground that is still new ground that is calling out all the time for new voices for new experiences and to have and to know that each one of you as you write your story you can approach this from different angles like i said the dante stewart angle jackie lewis's preacher angle of trying to get a sort of a theological point across about the love of god and the love of neighbor in the world or you know kind of just a i was born 
I got married on a cold, rainy night in December, and it was miserable. And it wasn't miserable for why you think. It was miserable because I was pretending to be a man, and I really wasn't. And so I think that this is some of the most important work we can do right now. And I'm really happy that you gave me time to talk about it. <laughs>